As far as getting in a dressing room and becoming acclimated with the guys, you know, hanging out, going to lunch, going to dinner, practice, that's, that's, all, that's all valuable stuff. But where you really get to show people who you are, um, are in games. When you've got 20 guys on the other team trying to beat you, trying to take the puck from you, uh, trying to take what's yours, and you have an opportunity to show your teammates, without words, who exactly you are. Forget that part. Before junior, I used to play with some people and like we'd get together and learn some songs and kind of write our own stuff. And then uh, once I moved away for junior, kind of stopped that and then uh, kind of would just bring an acoustic with me on the road basically. This one. Defenseman Frank Corrado had taken his collection of guitars with him after being drafted by the Vancouver Canucks in 2011. It's kind of a cool guitar. But after being placed on waivers at the beginning of the 2015 16 season, Corrado began hearing rumors that he had been claimed, that he and his collection might be headed home. So basically it was, you know, 24 hours of not knowing anything and then um, at 12 o'clock that was the deadline and um, a couple people had texted me saying, hey, it's Toronto and, you know, shortly after that Lou Lamorello called me and um, he told me he was going to get me to Toronto as soon as possible but I was actually already in Toronto. I was, I was actually at my grandmother's house which is in Woodbridge here. I was a huge Leaf fan growing up. It was obviously, a dream come true. It was uh, pretty emotional to uh, to get picked up by Toronto. I went right to the rink, met the coaches and, and the guys, and um, they were just so welcoming of uh, of me. And it was a great, great locker room to come into. The timing of Corrado's arrival was difficult. He had missed training camp. With a full slate of defensemen, there wasn't an available spot in the Leafs lineup which meant that off the top of the season, Corrado trained with the team while remaining a healthy scratch. You know, they, they just told me to be ready. Um, you know, I'll get a chance to play. And just one of those things that's out of your control. So, you know, you can only control what, what you can. Um, for me, that was just, you know, getting in the gym, working out, um, working hard in practice, executing in practice, staying on late, working on things, um, you know, making sure my conditioning was, was up to par because, you know, you never know when you're going to get the chance. Frankie's going to get his goal. We'll make sure he gets in and gets playing. We're not sending him to the Marys. We have a plan. Just because we haven't shared it with you doesn't mean we don't have a plan. This one's probably my favorite guitar that I have. It's, uh, it's an old... 1982 uh, Fender Stratocaster. I uh, got it in Chicago. You know, obviously there's some some nicks and, and stuff. These knobs are kind of losing their color. It just adds to the character of it. Um, I think it was it was the lockout year, that 0405 lockout year. I was just so bored because there was no hockey on TV. Decided to pick up the guitar and kill some time. And that movie School of Rock came out, and uh, that was one of my favorite movies. So I took lessons till I was, not even, yeah, four or five years, till I was 16 I took lessons. If you practice a lot, then the lessons will obviously advance and you'll learn a lot more. Corrado's wait ultimately lasted 10 weeks. Still, Coach Babcock kept insisting his time would come. So Corrado just kept working. You know, anytime you sit out or you're not playing, you have to use it to your advantage. So whether it's staying on the ice after morning skate and kind of bag skating or um, getting your workout done, you know, during the game and heading upstairs and watching instead of watching on TV. So, you know, you can actually see what's happening live. It's not necessarily a, a great thing to, to sit out, but um, you can definitely try and learn from it and uh, turn it into a positive somehow. You know, listen, like, there's obviously 
way worse situations you could be in in the world, you know, like we're, we're hockey players playing in the NHL. Um, if you miss a game, obviously you're not happy about it, but, um, you know, take a look at it from, from some perspective, you know. It's a privilege to be doing what we're doing, so you have to treat it that way and persevering uh, through times like that is, is what's going to make you better. Finally, that perseverance paid off. With the trade of Dion Phaneuf, suddenly Corrado was given more playing time and he took advantage. You know, for me, nothing's really ever been given to me, so I've really had to work hard, you know, whether it's been minor hockey or junior hockey. You know, when you kind of learn at an early age how important it is to, to have that effort, it'll help you in the long run. You're going to work hard every day no matter what, and that's going to help you be the best player and person you can be. After a humbling 7-2 loss to Chicago, the Toronto Maple Leafs hope to bounce back as they return home to face the New York Rangers. For Colin Greening, who had been playing for the Binghamton Senators of the AHL a week and a half before, February 18th was yet another chance to prove his value to his new team. Being dealt to the Leafs in the blockbuster Dion Phaneuf trade had come as a shock, but it now presented Greening with a career-altering opportunity. We were working out in, uh, in Binghamton. We had a game the next day. I think I was like mid-jumping jack, and one of our trainers grabbed me, and I was like, oh, okay, I, I've seen this before. And I said, uh, it's, either, it's either I'm getting called up or I'm getting traded. And sure enough, the assistant general manager told me, said there's you know, a potential trade here. So I called my wife. She was in the middle of Wegmans picking up some, some groceries. She was in the line paying for everything. And I called her and she kept saying, well, well do I pick up the groceries? Like, do, what, what do I do here? Like, do I just leave the cart? <laughs> she actually ended up buying all the groceries. <laughs> she said she was too chicken to actually renege all this stuff. You know, I, I think with with Ottawa, it's, it, it has run its course. You know, it was a great time in Ottawa. They treated me really, really well. But for me, you know, it's about moving forward, and I think that's the most important thing. I don't want to dwell on things that happened in the past, but it's about, you know, playing well and playing in a system here that uh, I know I, I can uh, excel in. And I think that's uh, I, I think that's the most important thing for me to think about right now. Leafs return home for nine of the next eleven at the ACC, starting with an original six matchup against the New York Rangers. Third meeting between these two teams, the Rangers winning the first. Two. There's a look back at front score, and the Leafs have the icebreaker. P.A. Parento on the doorstep. Crazy Carroll, but he's done a really good job so far. Oh, what a stop that was by Ronta. Great feed in front by Colin Greening, and Brad Boyce is robbed. For Greening, arriving in Toronto was a homecoming of sorts. As a 17-year-old, he had been recruited to come here from St. John's, Newfoundland, to attend Upper Canada College, the school from which he'd ultimately been drafted in the seventh round after graduation. There's, there's Steve, Steve McKell. He was the one that recruited me. Actually, it was Steve and his dad. His dad was the one that went to a prospects tournament in PEI, and that's where I was. Uh, I just turned 17. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty big move. I know it was tough for my family. They lived all their lives in Newfoundland, so for, for the son to move away it was, I guess, a big deal for us. It was a lot to take in when I first moved here, but I think that's one of the reasons why I moved away too, because I wanted that challenge and I wanted to, I guess, broaden my horizons is probably the best way to, to put it. Greening's route to the NHL was anything but typical. By the time he was drafted in 2005, he had already agreed to attend Cornell University, where he went on to play a full four years. The NHL had never been in his plans. It wasn't until the end of my first my first season I thought maybe it was an option. Someone had told me that there was a uh, an NHL scout that had come watch me play. I thought they were joking. And then the next year there was another scout, another scout here, and I thought that was a bit odd because it was you know it was Toronto high school hockey. I thought well maybe there's a chance. But after leaving Cornell, it didn't take Greening long to impress the Senators organization earning 13 points in 24 games for Ottawa in his first season out of school. After being a key part of Senators' teams for three seasons, however, Greening saw his playing time diminish, before finally being sent to Binghamton for the entirety of the 2015-16 season. Before the trade, that is. When I was, when I was sent down to Binghamton, that was, it was a hard pill to swallow, but at the end of the day, I realized that it was going to be an opportunity for me to actually play. When I went down there, I played a lot. I got my confidence back. You feel proud about what you're doing. You feel like you actually have an effect on the game. 
now coming to Toronto, wherever I play, it's important that you want to take pride in whatever position you, you are, you know, you, you want to play. It's, it's surreal. I, I grew up as a Leafs fan. Can't believe I actually get to put on a jersey that uh, you idolized growing up. So, it was, you know, it's pretty special. Though the Leafs would ultimately fall 4-2 to the Rangers, Greening's first goal as a Maple Leaf was yet another step towards establishing a fresh start for the veteran and proving he deserved a place in the Leafs locker room. The NHL trade deadline was approaching. And with so many players nearing the ends of their contracts, General Manager Lou Lamorello would be busy. On February 21st, Sean Mathias was dealt to the Colorado Avalanche. Then, on the 22nd, Nick Spalling and alternate captain Roman Polak were sent to the San Jose Sharks. Five days later, on February 27th, goaltender James Reimer, the longest serving Maple Leaf on the present roster, was dealt to San Jose as well. I think what it should mean to everyone. I think just you have a chance to uphold the history and, and wear, you know, that uh, jersey with pride. I mean, you want to work hard, you want to be a character guy, and you want to be honest, and, and I think that's what comes with, with wearing that jersey. And obviously this has been, uh, you know, the team I've been with my whole career, and so, you know, it's sad to, uh, to uh, you know, leave a city and, and, you know, a fan base that, uh, you know, I've been with for so long. Well, he's a good man. He practiced hard and worked hard, and I thought he had a good year for us. Rhymes is going to be a free agent this summer. Obviously, a team in transition like us, I don't think anything surprises you. You know, I've been talking to Rhymes for years now since I first came into this organization. So, you know, he was a good mentor for me. Uh, he's, a, he's a great goalie, and uh, hopefully he gets an opportunity out there. Goaltender Garrett Sparks was the first of a group of AHL Toronto Marlies to be called up to fill new spots on the roster. And after Daniel Winnick was traded to the Washington Capitals the night before the trade deadline, Lamorello called up four more young Marley prospects, all of whom would make their NHL debuts. Well, I, this was our plan all along, that once we got to the uh, trade deadline, uh, we felt there was you know, the opportune time with 20 games left uh, to try and get as many of these uh, young guys that we can in here to get the experience. William Nylander, Kasperi Kapanen, Nikita Sashnikov, and Zach Hyman won't play every game down the stretch for the Maple Leafs, but GM Lou Lamorello made it clear the team isn't concerned about burning a year off their entry-level contracts. I mean, it's, been a, it's been a great journey and finally get uh, get a chance here, so it's going to be uh, lots of fun. <laughs> Along with new acquisitions, Connor Carrick, Ben Smith, and Brooks Like, these young players were amongst seven new Leafs skating that night against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Career, have you ever had a team this young uh, in any level? Of well, yeah, in junior, I coached junior for a long time. <laughs> Really coming up after the trade deadline was a plan that we always had and hoped for. And it was it was to give ourselves a bit of a boost this year, but also really for them to gain some experience. It's really about just sort of like their first step in the maturing process of becoming a Leaf uh, as opposed to a Marley. William Nylander will take the face off with Zach Hyman on his right wing. They're making their National Hockey League debuts and we're underway here in Toronto. While Garrett Sparks made several miraculous saves, the Maple Leafs conceded two goals in the second period and needed to claw back late in the third. Well, the first game for, for any player, you don't really know what you're seeing. Um, and you don't know if what you're seeing is sustainable. Sometimes very good players will not play well in the beginning because they're so nervous. And sometimes players will play over their head. 
As they settle in, you start to get a better sense of who they are and, and, and where they can progress. Henry, the top of the circle, shoots, scores, passes, and three. And Toronto's in one. With a minute left to go, and sparks pulled, Kapanen, Hyman, and Nylander all found themselves on the ice, pressing in hopes of forcing overtime. Winning is something you have to learn. Um, just having a bunch of good players doesn't necessarily get you wins. It's really trial and error, and uh, it's it's just experience. For Riley to Gardner, lots of traffic in front. Gardner, final minute now. Here's Riley down the knee liner, centers it, cap it in, shoots save by Vasilevsky. It gets by Gardner and out. Back goes Riley. The Kucherov hems Riley in, and the Lightning. Get a 2-1 win on a night in which four Toronto players made their NHL debuts and three of them were on the ice in the final minute with a chance to tie it. They're fast, they're hard on the puck, they got skill. You know, they're excited, they want to play. I mean, your first game of the National Hockey League is a big deal. I mean, you watch them, they're exciting. But they're also kids. The four Marley call-ups hadn't been the only ones making their Leafs debuts on February 29th. Less than 24 hours after being dealt from the first place Washington Capitals, Brooks Lake had landed in Toronto just in time to lace up. Yeah, it was neat to find out the numbers after that. I think four guys making their NHL debut, I think seven guys making their Maple Leaf debut. I mean, it's not an ideal situation conducive to win a hockey game. My parents got me this book of hockey quotes. I remember one quote in there, a coach, I'm not sure who it was, but he said, um, defensively, we looked like a bunch of pregnant foxes running around in a forest fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it felt a little bit, because you know, I, I had to learn my line mates' names, but I just met them like an hour before we played a hockey game, I had to learn their names, where you're from, whatever. We had to figure out who's gonna play center, who's gonna play left, right. So there was a bunch of commotion in that first game. But since we got that one out of the way, I felt like we've made great strides off the ice, which has really helped the communication on the ice. After the initial shock of being dealt from an organization where he'd spent 12 years, Like was now acclimating himself with his new teammates. I've really found that to be unique and special in this locker room. Guys genuinely care about each other and will play alongside and play hard for and respect everybody in the locker room and it's really a family atmosphere where everybody has a voice and it's not one guy's up here and one guy's out here and one guy's over there or here it's it's a unique um, togetherness and you hear that a lot in sports but it's actually very true in this locker room my role in washington had severely diminished and i didn't see much of a future there here i get the opportunity to play and i need to build my game back up 200 foot game power play, penalty kill, moving my feet, driving to the net, shooting pucks, all that sort of thing builds into your identity. And if I can do that, then your, your voice carries a little more weight in the locker room. I've always believed that well done is better than well said. Mere days after the trade, Brooks was back in Washington to face his old teammates and the Capitals fans who had grown to love him. Yesterday, I think, was... Um, pretty special time for me, but also a pretty important day to get over with. I think that helps me close off that chapter and then woke up this morning and my whole mindset was just on being part of this organization. The first thing for me is I need to drop old habits. In DC, we've had the same coaching staff for the last two years, so um, your protocol on the ice, your systems is, is kind of second nature. I need to drop those old, old habits and, and pick up these ones as fast as possible. Now, Like and his team needed to prepare for another homecoming, this time that of recently traded Leafs captain, Dion Phaneuf. On behalf of all of Leafs Nation and the entire city of Toronto, thank you, Dion. But once the tribute was over, it was down to business. After the Senators went up 1-0, the Leafs clawed their way back. It's an extra shift. William Nylander shoots. He scores! Like had set up Nylander's father's last goal in the NHL. Now, here he was, assisting on William's first. That intergenerational link was one the veteran hoped to continue, as he helped the young players in the Leafs' locker room adapt to life in the pros. 
Well, you have to have some experience in the room, and uh, not just for what they do for the young players, but what, what a veteran just sort of knows how to do in a hockey game. And when you have good people and you've got veterans that know how to lead, and they lead not just by talking, but by doing the right things, it's always helpful. Can't be underrated. If you have effort, relentless on pucks, you work together, and you have all of that stuff on the ice, and you have that off-ice foundation to take onto the ice, we're right in every hockey game. We really have some good building blocks here that I, I think are um, people haven't quite seen yet. Um, I think we're going to surprise a lot of people. I really do. Sashnikov into the power play. Snaps a shot. He scores. What a shot by Nikita Sashnikov. And Toronto has a 2-1 lead. After Sashnikov's go-ahead goal, the Maple Leafs gradually lost hold of their lead. And ultimately, the game. I think that they're working really hard, uh, but it's not enough. It's not enough to just simply say you worked hard. We also have to work intelligently. And, you know, that is the part of learning how to win that we're still, as a group, working on. The fans that are coming to our games are, are looking really to see a team that is laying down a foundation of who we are. And I think until this year started, the answer to that question, like who, who are we, was not something that we liked. It wasn't a flattering answer. You know, we've had to move some people um, to create space, to create opportunities. This is about laying down the beginning of who, who we are, and you can't do that in week one. You do it for an entire season, and you do it over and over again, so it never ends.